Chapter 10 is going to be about the water-soluble vitamins. Now, before I get into the vitamins chapter, one thing that I do want to mention is that for the vitamins, there is a ton of information. So I'm going to try to streamline it for basically just what I want you to know, what you're going to be tested on. So we're going to be focusing primarily on knowing which category the vitamins fall in. Are they water soluble? Are they fat soluble? Also, we're going to be focusing on the function of the vitamins. That's the main thing that I want you to know. I want you to know what these vitamins do. We're also going to be looking at some deficiencies and toxicities. If they're not very common, I'm just going to uh, skim over them really quickly. But if I do want you to know about them, then I will um, talk about them in a little, a little bit more depth. So because of this, I have not included the things such as the RDA requirement for each vitamin, the um, sources for each vitamin. These are things that you can look at in your book if you are interested, but I'm not going to be testing you on those, so I'm just going to go over the functions, deficiencies, and toxicities. Now let's go ahead and get started. So first thing, the vitamins can be divided up into two categories, water-soluble and fat-soluble. This chapter is covering the water-soluble vitamins. So let's go ahead and take a look at how those differ from fat-soluble. Now the water-soluble vitamins are excreted when you consume too much of them. So basically, if you consume the water-soluble vitamins in excess, they're just going to go into your urine, and then that's going to be released when you use the restroom. Whereas the fat-soluble vitamins, anything extra that you consume is actually going to be stored in your body. Now, because of this difference, they are a little bit different when it comes to their risk of developing deficiencies or toxicities. The water-soluble vitamins have a much higher risk of deficiency since the body doesn't store any excess. When you consume that vitamin, the body's going to use what it needs, and then it's going to toss the rest out in your urine. So you need to make sure that you're consuming the water-soluble vitamins on a daily basis because you don't have storage to rely on. So it's very easy to develop a deficiency with the water-soluble. Now with the fat soluble, since we do store extra in the body, it's not that much of a concern when it comes to deficiencies. Because if you miss that vitamin one day, your body can go ahead and go to whatever it stored from one of the other days where you had a little extra of that vitamin in your diet. Now for toxicities, it's the opposite. The water soluble vitamins, we don't have to really worry about toxicity because we're not going to be storing any excess. You can be consuming a bunch more than you need of a water-soluble vitamin, and the body will just flush it out. Whereas with the fat-soluble vitamins, it's a lot easier to develop a toxicity since we do store it in the body. If you consume excess on a daily basis, we're going to be storing that excess more and more each day, and it could eventually build up to a toxic level in our body. Another thing that I want you to know in general about the water-soluble vitamins is that since they are water-soluble, if they are allowed to sit in water or have contact with water for a prolonged period of time, the vitamins can actually seep out into the water. So basically, let's say that you have fruits or vegetables that contain water-soluble vitamins and you soak them in water or maybe you're boiling them. As they're sitting in that water, the vitamins are going to um, basically leach out into the water. Now, that is one way where some people lose the vitamins because a lot of times you're boiling vegetables you toss out the water afterwards. But there are ways to prevent these losses. First, you can use dry cooking methods. So 
for example, things like baking, grilling, stir-frying, where the vegetable is not making contact with water. Or if you do have to boil it, try to minimize the amount of water that you use and try to boil it for as little time as possible. You can also consume the water that the uh, vegetable was boiled in. So for example, you boil some vegetables, take the vegetables out, and then use that water for another part of your meal, like making soup, making a stew, making rice, pasta, basically anything where you can end up consuming that water. That way, even though the vitamins are now in the water, you're still going to be putting them into your body. So we're going to start off looking at the B vitamins. Our water-soluble vitamins are uh, composed of B vitamins and vitamin C. Now, the B vitamins are plenty, but they all have one role in common, and that is they act as coenzymes to help with energy metabolism. Now, if you remember, we said that only our macronutrients provide us with direct energy, so things like protein, carbohydrates, and fat. But the B vitamins are really important for helping us get the energy out of these macronutrients. They're going to help the carbs, protein, and fat go through the metabolism cycle so that we can make all of that ATP that we discussed back in the metabolism chapter. So that's what we're going to be looking at here. Each B vitamin is going to help make a coenzyme, and then that coenzyme is going to help in the steps of metabolism in some way. So let's go ahead and take a look at what a coenzyme is. We already looked at enzymes before. We said an enzyme is something that helps reactions happen, either splitting something apart like our digestive enzymes, or helping us uh, put something together. So a coenzyme is something that is going to help an enzyme do its job. Sometimes an enzyme can't fully complete its task without a coenzyme's help. And that's what we're seeing here in the picture. You have in the picture to the far left, you have an enzyme uh, you have two enzymes and then three compounds that need to fit into the enzymes. But the active site where those compounds need to sit are not the correct shape. And so in the second picture, you have these coenzymes in red coming in and attaching themselves to the enzymes so that now they are the perfect shape for the compounds to fit into them. So in picture three, you see that now the compounds can go ahead and attach and then either split up like you see in the last picture with C and D or come together like A and B. So again, a coenzyme is going to help an enzyme do its task. So let's go ahead and take a look at our very first B vitamin, which is thiamine. Thiamine is going to make coenzyme TPP. And this coenzyme is really important for energy metabolism because it's going to help convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. If you remember, when we looked at metabolism, we said that we um, go from glucose to pyruvate and then pyruvate to acetyl-CoA when we have the aerobic pathway. That step of converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA would not be possible without the help of coenzyme TPP, and we wouldn't be able to make TPP without thiamine. When it comes to deficiencies and toxicities with thiamine, toxicity, you'll notice that it says no adverse effects, no upper limit, and you'll see that as a common theme in this chapter because we're going to be looking at water-soluble vitamins, which we said the body excretes when you consume an excess. And so a lot of um, what you'll be seeing is that they don't have an upper limit set since 
it's really hard to get a toxicity. Your body will just basically um, send it out of your body and through urine. Now for deficiencies, it is something that is more likely to happen since we don't store thiamine. And the individuals that it most happens in is going to be malnourished individuals. This can be individuals who just aren't eating enough, and because of that they're not getting thiamine, or individuals who are alcoholics. And the reason for this is because while alcohol is in your system, you're not able to absorb any thiamine that you're consuming. And so for alcoholics who have alcohol in their system the majority of the time, they are not going to get the chance to absorb thiamine. Now the name of the deficiency that develops is called beriberi, and it's something that can affect the nervous system and make the individual feel really weak and fatigued, but it can also start to affect the cardiovascular system, and that's when we call it wet beriberi, because one of the main signs of this is fluid accumulation, or what we call edema. This over here shows us how edema would look like in the wet form of beriberi. You see that this person's foot is swollen, but it's not the typical type of swelling. It's swelling because there's a bunch of fluid accumulating right underneath the skin. And the sign of that is when they pressed into the skin, the indentation actually remained. So that tells us that it's not just inflammation swelling, it's fluid accumulation. Now our next B vitamin is called riboflavin and the main thing that I want you to know about riboflavin is that it makes coenzyme FAD. If you might recall when we looked at the metabolism chapter, we saw that in the TCA cycle there was coenzyme FAD and the role of FAD was to pick up hydrogens and electrons that were released in the TCA cycle and then deliver those to the electron transport chain. So we have two coenzymes that were responsible for picking up hydrogens and electrons and taking them over to the electron transport chain. And the coenzyme that did this in the TCA cycle was called FAD. And FAD is made by using riboflavin. Now, when it comes to deficiency and toxicities, neither of them are really very common. But one unique thing that I do want you to know about riboflavin is that it is something that is um, not just susceptible to being uh, lost in water, but it is also something that is very highly uh, susceptible to destruction by light, exposure to light. And one of the main sources of riboflavin is actually in milk or dairy products. And if you think about how milk is packaged these days, it's packaged in semi-opaque gallons or in completely opaque cartons. And the reason for this is to uh, basically minimize the amount of light that is going to reach the milk so that it doesn't destroy the riboflavin that's in there. Next we have niacin, and niacin is actually going to make the second coenzyme that picks up hydrogens and electrons, and that is coenzyme NAD. NAD is actually the main coenzyme that goes around and picks up hydrogens and electrons from the very, very beginning of the metabolism cycle. So, so far we've mentioned two coenzymes that pick up hydrogens and electrons and take them to the electron transport chain. We have FAD that's made by riboflavin and NAD that is made by niacin. One unique thing about niacin is that our body can actually manufacture it. And the way that it does this is by using the amino acid tryptophan. If you have any excess tryptophan that your body no longer needs, it can actually take the tryptophan and convert it into niacin. 
And that's why sometimes you might see the RDA uh, written as nice and equivalents instead of milligrams or micrograms. And the reason for that is because it is counting any tryptophan that you consume that's being converted into niacin as well as any niacin that is already present in foods. Now with niacin it is um, again something that we can develop a deficiency with since we're still talking about water soluble vitamins and the name of the deficiency disease is called pellagra and it actually is associated, associated with the symptoms that we call the four Ds. These four Ds include diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis, and if it is not resolved, it can lead to death. This is a picture of the type of dermatitis that comes along with pellagra. So dermatitis means inflammation of skin, but as you can see, it is extremely inflamed. It's not just the um, very surface kind of inflammation that the typical individual might experience from a rash or so on. It's a very severe case and very um, unique when you do get the niacin deficiency. We did mention that water-soluble vitamins usually are not going to cause toxicities, but if you are taking extremely large amounts through supplement form, then it is something that can develop because what can happen is your body's trying to send it all in the urine and make it leave your body, but if you are constantly taking extremely high doses, uh, doses, then your body might not be able to keep up in the process of uh, sending it to the urine and flushing it out of your body. So it is possible to develop a toxicity with water-soluble vitamins. It's just a lot harder to do. And niacin is one of the water-soluble vitamins that uh, is more commonly seen to uh, form toxicities. And the reason for this is because some people will take niacin as a therapeutic dose. And what I mean by that is taking an extremely high dosage, almost 100 times more than the recommendation for niacin, because at that high of a dosage, it can help lower your bad cholesterol and raise your good cholesterol. Now, if you're going to do this, it needs to be with a doctor's supervision and guidance because it can cause some negative side effects. And one of those negative side effects is called niacin flush, where you get this warm, tingling, numbing sensation to your skin. Your skin might appear flushed, red in color. It's something that's just um, temporary. It might be a little uncomfortable, but it'll go away. It's just um, basically a sign that you're consuming more than what your body can process at that time. So usually if you do experience nice and flush, you'll want to maybe bring down your dosage a little bit or stay at that dosage until your body adapts and then you can move up a little bit more. So it's not something that you want to take all at once. You do want to increase gradually if you are taking a therapeutic dose. Next B vitamin we have is biotin. And the way that biotin is going to help in the metabolism cycle is that it's going to make a special coenzyme that helps convert pyruvate to oxaloacetate. Remember, oxaloacetate is what is needed for acetyl-CoA to be able to enter the TCA cycle. Otherwise, all of the acetyl-CoA that you made is not able to continue through the metabolism pathway. So oxaloacetate is really important, and it's something that we make from pyruvate. But without biotin, we won't be able to convert pyruvate into oxaloacetate. So very, very important. It also has a few other roles in the body, such as making different protein structures, 
making glucose out of protein and so on but the main one that I want you to focus on for this class is the ones that are related to metabolism which in this case is converting pyruvate to oxaloacetate. Now deficiencies and toxicities are both fairly rare when it comes to biotin. A deficiency can develop but it is going to be usually in the case of an individual consuming lots of raw egg whites. Now we're talking about 10 to 12 raw egg whites a day. So it's not something that is going to happen very easily. But in those situations, the reason that a biotin deficiency can occur is because the egg whites contain a protein that attaches onto biotin and prevents it from being absorbed in your body. Now keep in mind I said raw egg whites so when you cook them they're not going to affect the biotin that's being absorbed and the reason for this is if you remember we said one way to denature or deactivate a protein is by using heat. So what will happen is if you cook those egg whites, the protein that was going to bind to biotin and prevent it from being absorbed has been deactivated. So it's not going to be able to attach to biotin or prevent its absorption. Next B vitamin is pantothenic acid. And pantothenic acid is going to make coenzyme A. So this is a coenzyme that we've already been introduced to. If you remember, pyruvate removes a carbon and the remaining two carbons attach to coenzyme A and that creates the acetyl-CoA structure. So pantothenic acid is going to make coenzyme A and coenzyme A helps us make acetyl-CoA. Now, it is pretty widespread in lots of different types of foods, and so because of this, deficiencies are pretty rare. Next vitamin is vitamin B6, and it is going to make coenzyme PLP. This coenzyme is really important because it participates in over a hundred reactions in our body. I have a few of them listed here for you. It is going to help with amino acid metabolism, in particular converting keto, uh, ketogenic amino acids into ketones. It also helps to convert ammonia to urea. It's also going to help uh, convert the amino acid tryptophan into niacin and it also makes the protein structure heme and the nucleic acids in our body. So lots of different things and there's still plenty more that PLP does but if you take a look at these different um, roles that I mentioned right now uh, one thing that you can see in common is that they all have to do with protein or amino acids and that's because what PLP participates in for the most part is amino acid metabolism. Even though it participates in lots of different reactions, what it eventually comes down to is uh, reactions that relate to amino acids. So that's what I want you to know for B6 is the general role of PLP, which is made by B6, is amino acid metabolism or protein metabolism. Another unique thing about B6 is that it is actually stored in our muscles. We originally said that water-soluble vitamins are not stored in the body when you consume them in excess, but B6 is actually stored. Now because it is stored, it is something that can develop into a toxicity and this will usually present itself as irreversible nerve damage. Deficiencies also can develop and the uh, different ways that the deficiency can present itself, here I have a few of them listed, neurological damage, uh, which is damage to 
your nerves, and nerves are protein structures, anemia, which is a lack of red blood cells, red blood cells are protein structures, inflammation of the skin, your skin is also a protein structure. So these are just a few ways that the deficiency can present itself in your body, but you'll see that they all relate to protein in one way or another, since the role of B6 has to do with protein or amino acids. Next B vitamin is vitamin folate. Now, folate is going to make coenzyme THF, which is going to have lots of different roles one of its main roles is going to be to help B12 function. And I'll show you how it does this in the upcoming slide, but basically B12 and folate rely on each other for activation and for allowing each other to function. Now, it also is going to be really important for converting something called homocysteine into methionine. Homocysteine is an amino acid, but if it builds up in our body, it can lead to heart disease. So one way that we can prevent it from building up is by using transamination to convert homocysteine into a different amino acid. Usually the amino acid is methionine. So that's one thing that's important about folate is it can prevent homocysteine buildup. It's also really important for healthy cell division, as well as building the brain and spinal cord in uh, pregnant women, so in their babies. This picture over here shows us how folate and B12 work to activate each other. So we're starting off at the top, we ate something that had folate, it was absorbed into our body through the intestines, and now we want to use it. But folate at this point is attached to CH3. If you remember, CH3 is a methyl group. And as long as folate is attached to that methyl group, it's not able to function. It is inactive. Now on the other end of the spectrum, B12 cannot function until it attaches to a methyl group. So what it's going to do is B12 will come in and separate folate from the methyl group and take the methyl group for itself. And this is going to work to activate both folate and B12. Now folate is free from the methyl group so it can be active. And B12, which needed a methyl group, can go ahead and take it from folate and activate itself as well. When it comes to recommendations for folate, it's actually something that is um, better to be taken from supplement form, especially for individuals who are um, basically who have a higher need, like pregnant women. And the reason for this is because in food, it still needs to be activated, like we just saw, whereas in supplements, it's already in its active form. Now, for pregnant women, this is really important because they already have a higher need and we want to make sure that the folate that they get is going to be active, especially since the folate is really critical for the development of the brain and spinal cord of the baby. If a mother uh, doesn't have enough folate in the first four or five weeks of pregnancy, the baby is going to develop something called a neural tube defect where there is some kind of defect in the development of the brain or spinal cord. It's absolutely necessary for the brain and spinal cord to develop properly and this is in the first four to five weeks. If the uh, um, folate is not consumed during that time then it's not going to be able to fully develop even if the woman um, started consuming folate afterwards, if it wasn't there in the first four to five weeks, then it's very likely that a neural tube defect will develop in the baby. Now, there are two main types of neural tube defects. 
we have one that's called spina bifida, where the spinal cord doesn't fully close up, so the nerves are exposed and vulnerable. Or we have something called anencephaly, where the baby is born with um, only part of a brain or sometimes no brain at all. This over here is showing you a picture of spina bifida. Again, the spinal cord is not fully closed off, it's not fully developed, and so some of the nerves in, the, in that area are going to be exposed and readily damaged. Since it's so important for the development of a healthy baby, uh, in the U.S. it became mandatory to fortify foods, in particular grains, with folate. This wasn't always the case. If you look at this chart that shows the prevalence of neural tube defects, um, in the very beginning there was no fortification and the rate of neural tube defects was very high. Then when they realized what the problem was, they started um, putting the uh, recommendation out there that it would be a good idea if companies went ahead and fortified their products with folate, but they didn't make it mandatory. And that's what you see there in between those two lines on the uh, chart. That is where you see the drop happening because some companies started fortifying their foods with folate. Once the government saw the big difference, they decided to go ahead and make it mandatory. And you can see that that has um, also caused a further decrease in the amount of neural tube defects. Now, another thing that can happen if an individual doesn't have enough folate. So far we've talked about if a pregnant woman doesn't have enough folate, what can happen? But individuals who are not pregnant can also suffer from deficiencies that can present themselves in other ways. We said folate is really important for um, basically getting rid of homocysteine buildup. And so if you don't have folate, the homocysteine can build up and lead to heart disease. We also said it's really important for healthy cell division, protein synthesis, which includes our red blood cells. So one thing that can happen is anemia from a folate deficiency. Now, this is showing us the way that anemia can develop if an individual doesn't have enough folate. So let's go ahead and look at what healthy, normal red blood cell production looks like on the left. So we start off with the DNA telling us how to make the red blood cell, and the cell begins to develop. Then what happens is we start developing hemoglobin, in the cell, red blood cells contain hemoglobin in them, and that's what gives them their red color. Now, after this, the hemoglobin is going to continue to grow and intensify, which is giving the cells a more red color, and the cells will go ahead and divide into two. After this, the nucleus that's in the center of the cell will start to migrate towards the um, surface of the cell and eventually leave. And as the nucleus leaves, it makes more room for hemoglobin to continue to grow, which makes the cells even more red. Now on the right hand side, we have what can happen if you don't have enough folate. So we start off things like normal, DNA tells us how to make the red blood cell, and we begin developing it. And then we start uh, basically uh, synthesizing the hemoglobin and intensifying the buildup of hemoglobin which gives the red color but instead of the cell dividing like it normally does if you don't have folate which is really important for cell division then it will actually uh, just grow as one really large cell instead of splitting into two and often the nucleus doesn't leave either so what you end up with are these really large, irregularly shaped cells. And one thing that you'll notice at the very bottom is that they're actually more pale in color than normal red blood cells. 
and that's because since the nucleus isn't leaving, there's not much space for hemoglobin. Since folate is water soluble, toxicity is going to be something that will usually only happen if someone is taking a bunch of supplements. And what we're going to be concerned about at that time is that it can mask or hide a B12 deficiency. And the reason for this is because B12 and folate not only activate each other, but they also have a lot of the same roles and they can actually substitute for each other when one is missing. And so sometimes if you have a um, B12 deficiency, but you're taking a bunch of extra folate, that extra folate can substitute for the missing B12 and do its job. And because of this, you won't ever know that you have a B12 deficiency. And that's not a good thing. You might think, well, why does it matter if folate can just sub, sub in for B12? But the reason is that B12 does have its own unique role that folate can't actually do. So if we do have a B12 deficiency, we want to make sure that we know about it. Going on to B12, we mentioned that it has a lot of the same roles as folate, like converting homocysteine to methionine, making red blood cells important for cell division as well. But the one thing that is different from folate is that it helps to maintain the myelin sheath. Your myelin sheath is a covering or insulation for your nerves in your spinal cord. And this is if you can think of any electrical device that has a wire. The, wire, um, the wires are usually covered with some kind of insulation. They're not just exposed to the environment because we don't want those wires to get damaged or to interact with the environment and conduct electricity that is um, going to be harmful. And same thing goes for your nerves. We don't want your nerves exposed and um, basically open to damage. And so we have this covering or insulation around the nerves. And that is called the myelin sheath. B12 is really important for maintaining the health of the myelin sheath. And if you didn't have B12, what would happen is you would eventually uh, break down your the myelin sheath that is covering your nerves and then your nerves would be exposed and you would eventually have nerve damage and this is why we want to know when we have a B12 deficiency because if for example we were consuming so much folate that folate was substituting in for B12 we would not see the early signs of a B12 deficiency. For example, that anemia that we saw for folate, that's something that can happen from uh, B12 deficiency as well. And if we weren't consuming excess folate, we would see that deficiency and know early on to correct the B12 deficiency. But if you were consuming excess folate, what would happen is even if the anemia is caused by a B12 deficiency, if you have extra folate, that folate can come in and fix the anemia, even though the anemia was caused by a B12 deficiency. Folate can still come in there and fix the anemia, and it will basically fix any other symptoms that B12 deficiency would usually show. The only thing that folate can't fix is the damage to the myelin sheath and that is something that you're not going to know about it's not something that really shows outward symptoms until it is too late where you have major nerve damage and it's to the point where it's irreversible so that's really not something that we want to know oh, that we want to miss we want to see those early signs of a b12 deficiency so that we can correct it before it gets to the point where we have irreversible nerve damage. 
I did mention that uh, we weren't going to focus on the sources of vitamins, but if there is a unique source where a vitamin can only be found in very particular sources, I will discuss that and expect you to know it. And B12 sources are one of those. They are only found in animal foods. And so people who are vegetarian or vegan are going to need to take a vitamin B12 supplement because they're not going to be able to get it from their regular diet. Another thing that I want to mention is that B12 is something that is very easily destroyed through a microwave. So if you are consuming something that has a high level of vitamin B12 and you're relying on that for your um, meeting your requirement, you want to make sure not to microwave that food. Another unique thing about B12 is that it actually requires quite a bit of effort in order for it to be absorbed into the body. We start off with B12 attached to a protein when you consume it from food, and then when it reaches your stomach, the acid is going to denature that protein, which means it's going to become deactivated and break off. It's going to be released from B12. Now, this is something that we need to happen because our third step is attaching B12 to the intrinsic factor. And we can't do this unless the first protein is removed. So once that protein is removed using the acid in the stomach, B12 can go ahead and attach to the intrinsic factor as it moves into your small intestine. Now, the reason we want to attach to the intrinsic factor is because the cells of the small intestine actually don't recognize B12 and don't absorb B12 as it is, but they recognize the intrinsic factor. And so if B12 is attached to the intrinsic factor, the cells will recognize the intrinsic factor and go ahead and absorb it along with the B12 that's attached to it. So that's the fourth step that we have there. The B12 is going to be seen by the cell receptors because it's now attached to the intrinsic factor. And then the cells will go ahead and absorb the intrinsic factor along with the B12 that's attached to it. Now, some individuals will have deficiencies of B12, not because they're not eating enough B12, but because they have some kind of issue that is getting in the way of these five steps for absorption. For example, some individuals have uh, stomach issues that prevent their body from making enough HCL, or they're on certain medication that prevents that. And HCL is that acid that breaks off the protein so that the intrinsic factor can be attached. If they don't have enough of that acid in the stomach, they're going to be stuck at step two, and we're not going to be able to attach B12 to the intrinsic factor, which means the cells won't recognize it and they won't absorb it. Another issue is that some people have some kind of genetic defect where their body just doesn't make enough intrinsic factor or any at all. And if it, we don't have the intrinsic factor to bind to, the B12 that you consume is just going to go into your body and out of it without being recognized, without being absorbed. So these um, factors are really important for making sure the individual is actually making use of the B12 that they're consuming. This diagram over here is nothing that you need to memorize. This is the uh, basically overview of all of the metabolism cycle that we learned in the previous chapter. But the reason it's here now is because we were just looking at all of the different coenzymes that are made by the B vitamins and how they participate in the steps of metabolism. And now we're seeing them all here. So if you're interested, in seeing the big picture of how all of those coenzymes work with metabolism. This is the diagram to look at. Um, for example, we have the TPP, which helped um, convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and that was a coenzyme made from thiamine. 
So these are just things that you can look at to help you grasp how all of those coenzymes that we just discussed are going to help us with metabolism. Now that we're done with the B vitamins, we can go ahead and take a look at our last water-soluble vitamin, which is vitamin C. Vitamin C has a lot of different roles, but its primary role is being an antioxidant. We mentioned previously that antioxidants protect us against free radical damage. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at what that actually means. So let's go ahead and take a look at what a free radical actually is. If you take a look at the picture in blue, this is showing us what a healthy atom looks like. So we have a ring that has all of these electrons on it, and you'll notice that the electrons are paired up. This is going to be what a stable, healthy atom looks like. Now, if an atom was missing, we would have what we call unpaired electrons, so an electron that's on its own, and that causes the atom to actually become unstable, and that's when we call it a free radical. So you see the atom in red is missing, a free, is missing an electron. We have one electron that's there on its own on the left side of the free radical, and so because of that, the atom is no longer stable since it's missing that electron, and the issue here is that if the atom is not stable, it is going to react very easily with its environment in a negative way. It's going to cause damage to the tissues and cells that are around it. Now, the other problem here is that usually what a free radical will do is it will try to stabilize itself by stealing electrons from other healthy atoms or compounds. And what that's going to do is if the free radical steals an electron, the atom that it stole the electron from is now missing an electron. So that atom is now going to turn into a free radical as well. And it's going to go and look to steal from another atom. And this will continue as a chain reaction where we keep making more and more free radicals. Now, an antioxidant is going to help protect us against this free radical damage because what it can actually do is donate one of its electrons and still remain stable. So we said that a free radical goes around and tries to stabilize itself by stealing other atoms' electrons, and then those atoms become free radicals as well. But antioxidants have a bunch of extra electrons that they can donate without becoming unstable. And so they basically go around and stabilize free radicals by giving them electrons and that way, the free radical is now stabilized. It's not going to cause damage to the cells and tissues around it. And it's going to stop that chain reaction because the free radical isn't going to go steal electrons from healthy atoms. So that's going to be how antioxidants actually protect us against free radicals. And the main antioxidants are vitamins A, C, and E. If you put your body under a lot of stress, this is going to be pollution, uh, smoking, uh, stress, even if it's just emotional stress or even if it's physical stress. All of these things contribute to forming more free radicals. And if you don't have a steady supply of antioxidants, then this is going to be something that is going to further uh, create an issue with buildup of free radicals in your body, which can then cause a lot of damage. Certain diseases like cancers and diabetes can eventually develop from damage being done from free radicals.
Now that we know how the first role of vitamin C works, which is acting as an antioxidant, let's go ahead and take a look at the lesser known roles of vitamin C. Vitamin C is going to form what we call a cofactor, which is similar to a coenzyme in terms of helping different things happen. And one of the main things that, that it is going to help with is collagen formation. Collagen is basically what gives our body structure, and so that's a very important role. Now, there are certain myths about vitamin C and how it can get rid of illnesses, in particular a cold. Those are actually not true. Research has found that if you already take vitamin C or consume vitamin C from foods on a regular basis, then you may get colds less often or when you get them they won't be as long um, but if you get sick and then start taking a bunch of vitamin c to get rid of it that's not going to actually help so there is no real uh, benefit from loading up on vitamin c when you actually get sick if you are trying um, if you're doing that to try to get rid of the illness now one thing that it can help with is making you feel more comfortable when you're sick. And what I mean by that is vitamin C is actually a natural antihistamine. Histamines are what give you those uncomfortable symptoms like the stuffy nose, the itchy, um, itchy throat, itchy eyes. Sometimes those are things that are experienced during a cold. And often when you take cold medicine, they have um, histamines, uh, antihistamines in there to basically ease those symptoms. Now, vitamin C does this naturally. So that is something that um, further promotes this myth because people take vitamin C and they feel better. And so they believe that vitamin C gets rid of the cold when in actuality it's just temporarily relieving your symptoms like a cold medicine would do. So it can help make you feel more comfortable until the illness passes, but it's not going to actually get rid of the illness. So let's go ahead and take a look at the recommendations for vitamin C. Now I don't need you to actually memorize the recommendations, but I do want to show you a few things on this chart. One thing that I want to point out is if you look at the RDA for men and for women, you will notice that the, um, there is a separate one for men and women who are smokers. And the reason for this is because one of the main ways that vitamin C acts as an antioxidant is protecting your lungs from damage. So if you are a smoker, you are introducing toxins to your body that promote free radical damage to your lungs, and vitamin C is something that you're going to need more of for this reason to help fight those extra free radicals. Another thing that I want to point out is that there is a limit for absorption at the 200 mark. Now, the reason that I'm pointing this out is because a lot of those medications or supplements that are promoted to get rid of, to get rid of your cold have thousands of milligrams of vitamin C. And that really is just a marketing scheme because once you hit the 200 milligram mark, your body's not going to be able to absorb much, if any at all, of the remainder of that vitamin C. So there is no real uh, benefit in taking those supplements that have ridiculous amounts of vitamin C. Another thing that I want to point out is where uh, the deficiency actually develops. The deficiency, uh, the deficiency disease is something called scurvy. And if you look at where scurvy develops, in order to prevent scurvy, you only need to consume 10 milligrams. Even though the RDA is between 75 to 90 milligrams, you can consume less than the RDA and still not develop a deficiency disease because you have to drop below 10 milligrams for that deficiency to actually develop. 
Now, if you did develop a deficiency, the main way that it's going to present itself is through um, bleeding gums or what we call uh, pinpoint hemorrhages, where you see um, basically these red spots forming from underneath the skin. And this was something that used to form um, years and years ago when people used to take these long voyages on um, ship where they would uh, be gone for weeks, months at a time. And so at that time, they didn't have any form of portable refrigeration. So what they would do is they would consume all of their fresh foods first, which, include, which included their fresh fruits and vegetables, which contained all of the vitamin C. And then the remainder of, the, of their trip, they would survive off of the things that didn't need refrigeration, such as grains, nuts, seeds, which didn't have vitamin C in them. And so because of this, these individuals were going long periods of time without any vitamin C at all. And so this is when scurvy used to be seen, but these days it's very, very difficult to um, get scurvy since you only need a very little amount of vitamin C to prevent it. Now this is what I was referring to where you have the pinpoint hemorrhages. You see all of the red dots underneath the skin. That is from internal bleeding due to a vitamin C deficiency. Again, I don't need you to know the um, sources, but I wanted to show you this. Um, to show you how difficult it is to um, get scurvy. Remember we said you need to be under 10 milligrams for scurvy to develop. So if you take a look at the most popular source for vitamin C, which is oranges, one medium orange gives you 70 milligrams. So basically just a bite of an orange and you have your 10 milligrams and you'll no longer have a risk of uh, scurvy. Or if you don't like oranges, half a cup of broccoli can also provide you with basically the same amount. We also have kiwis, Brussels sprouts, red bell peppers, strawberries. Basically just a bite of any of those foods in your day is going to give you more than 10 milligrams. And that's why it's so difficult for vitamin C deficiency to actually develop these days.